So what are we actually going to cover today? Um, I'm going to talk through why Pasco. For, so for those of you that are new to the brand, um, I'm going to kind of introduce the kind of value of the Pasco system um, and what it can offer you in terms of your teaching delivery. Um, I'm going to talk about the wider data login range. So although I'm going to be focusing on the Pasco Force platforms, um, we've also got a huge range of biomechanics and physiology sensors that you guys might be interested in. All of them are compatible with the force plates um, and you can use them um, together. Uh, so that might be of interest for you. I'll give you an actual demo of the plates um, and then at the end we'll do a, a question and answer session. But again, if you've got any questions um, during, just feel free to come off mute and, uh, and ask me or type them in the chat, whatever you're more comfortable with. OK, so why Pasco? So as I said before, they are super, super affordable. So you are talking like maybe 300 ish pounds for a single axis force plate as opposed to like twenty thousand pounds for the gold standard kistler system um so we're talking like orders of magnitude cheaper so um if you are a sports science department and you're thinking about either going for kistler or pasco um please do bear in mind that if you did go for pasco then you'd be able to get a lot more bang for your buck so that means like smaller working groups um <clears throat> Obviously, there is quite a big difference between uh, Pasco and Kistler. So Kistler use like piezoelectric technology to get that load reading um, and we use strain gauge load cells. So that's why it's much more affordable. Um, but yeah, like I say, um, it would give you the opportunity to let more students have like hands on time with the kit. If you've only got a couple of Kistler plates to go around your whole lab class, then maybe there's quite a lot of downtime where students are just waiting to get on the kit. Um, and the other nice thing is that if you've got, say, for example, if you've got both, if you've got the budget for both, then you can kind of reserve your Kistler plates for the students when they kind of know a bit more about what they're doing. Obviously, if they take a, a Pasco plate and, you know, are a bit too rough with it and they break it, then it's not too much of a big problem breaking like a 300 pound piece of equipment. Whereas if they're let loose on a 20 grand piece of equipment and they break that, then that's going to be a lot more expensive for you. Um, so yeah it's kind of it's nice to be used as an introductory piece of kit um but also this is really prevalent in the literature that they do stand up to research level um so you know you've always got the opportunity to do that as well um they're super easy to use as i'll show you in the demo it's literally just you just have to plug them in um, turn the interface on start the software and press go and that's it um they're also really portable so with the kistler plates you'll find that um more often than not, they're embedded actually in the floor. So once they're in, they're in, there's no moving them. Um, I think you can get a portable Kistler plate, but they are so cumbersome and massive and big to move that um, it's not really, really practical. Um, with the Pasco plates, they are like 35 by 35 centimetres in terms of cross section. Um, and they're super light as well. So even though I'm, I'm pregnant, I can like pick them up and carry them around. It's really not a problem. Um, so that brings out the opportunity to like, you know, take it on site with you if you're going to um, meet with a like an external client um, or an external sports team, you can take it with you and showcase it to them and work with work with real athletes. Um, if you've got students that want to take it home to do research projects, you can absolutely do that. Um, or if you just wanted to take it to a different building for your lecture to give a demo, um, again, it's super easy to do that. Um, as I've said before, it's compatible with all of our other PASCO sensors, and I'll show you which ones we've got in just a second. Um, you can integrate it with other analog systems. So I've sent some of you a link to our case study with St Mary's University. Um, and that kind of talks through that. Um, if we've got time at the end, I'll just run through that with you guys. But it does mean that, um, you know, it's not just standalone force plate data. You can integrate it with, I think that one in particular talks about like the Vicon uh, motion capture systems um, so it makes it a bit more applicable with the rest of um with the rest of the equipment in your lab let's just make sure no one else is waiting to come in uh, here we go hi Heidi I have started but if you want to watch the beginning again you can just watch it in the recording when we uh when we uh when, when we send you out the link um so don't worry you can catch up with everything um so I'm just going through why Pasco um so we've come to this point validated in peer-reviewed journals so again in the notes that i send you afterwards um it will have some of the validation papers in there like links to those um that just kind of show exactly what pasco are capable of um 
and that you can use the, this equipment at research level should you want to which is a really cool thing to say about like a 300 piece, uh, pound piece of equipment, that it can stand up to that kind of level of scientific rigor. Um, where are we? What do I need? Here we go. <laughs> um, and I'll also put some links towards um, other papers that use the PASCO plates in there. Um, so again, when I sent out the invitations for these um, this webinar, um, I got loads and loads of really nice emails from academics saying, oh, we, we use these really successfully for our research. Um, and a lot of people wanted me to plug their papers. So I will be putting uh, citations to, to those papers in the notes. If you're watching now and you think, oh, I want to do that, uh, again, just please uh, just ping me an email after this with the, uh, with the citations and I'll make sure they're in there for you. Um, and then, yes, use in elite sports. So if you think about the biggest names, I don't actually think I can name the teams for GDPR reasons, but if you think about the names, uh, like the biggest names you can think of in like football, rugby, cricket, golf, um, even the Olympic teams, all of, well, not all of them, but some of those massive names are using our equipment, um, which you'd think is crazy because like they, they, they've got so much money, but apparently it's all reserved for players and not necessarily for the kit that they use for, for strength and conditioning. So, so there we go. <laughs> but it is really weird to think of some of the biggest football names having, having like, you know, our, our relatively cheap equipment in comparison to some of the uh, some of the more accurate ones. But but there we go. I guess it's just the way the world is. OK, so in terms of other um, sensors that we've got in the range, um, we have got this polar sensor. So if you're a sports scientist, you'll be very familiar with this brand. So Pasco have literally just hopped on the back of that polar module. Um, so this is a chest strap that ideally needs to go um, on the surface of the skin. Um, and I think I've read in the manual that it needs to be slightly wet. <laughs> so if you are from a secondary sector, um, maybe don't go for this one. You might have some barriers to, to doing this with your kids. Um, we do have a, a, like a, a handheld heart rate sensor um, that might be more applicable for secondary education. Um, on top of that, we've also got these gas sensors. So we've got um, carbon dioxide and oxygen. Um, and we've got these temperature links. So I've done another case study with Sunderland University. Um, so this little box here, this is the like um, temperature sensor module. And then these wires here are called fast response temperature probes. So these um, click into this little socket here. Um, and then Sunderland use these to collect core body temperature measurements. So again, an application that's solely applicable to HE because all bets are off at HE. Um, but what they do is they get um, like the end, the end of these wiry probes. Um, so yeah, these are these are wire probes. Essentially, it's just like a really thin wire. So they've got a really low thermal inertia, so they can get up to body temperature super quickly and give you a nice accurate reading. Um, again, for a very affordable price. Um, so they have to modify these to make them suitable for that application. So what they do is they get the end of the probe, like the last, say, 10 centimetres, um, and they cover it with electrical sheathing or heat shrink. Um, so they put some of that on there, heat it up with a glue, uh, with a, um, what's it called, a hot air gun, uh, just to shrink it to the wire, <laughs> and then go poking it in places where arguably you shouldn't go poking anything. Um, but yeah, it will give you a really nice, accurate reading for a core body temperature. And these are essentially like throwaway probes, so they cost about £10 each. So once you've used it once, um, you can just dispose of it as clinical waste. Um, these temperature links, I think, cost about 110 um, and that will ping wirelessly. It will ping your data wirelessly to um, your PC or even a tablet. Um, so again, it's just like a really nice, affordable way of being able to do CBT measurements. Um, as I said, we have done a full case study on that, so there's far more detail <laughs> if you can stomach it in the notes that I'll be sending out um, after the webinar. Um, we've got a conductivity probe, so you can look at like um, ions in sports drinks. Uh, we've got this blood, uh, blood, what's it called? Blood pressure cuff. Um, so this is one of my favourite things to demo as well. I wish I had one and I could show it you. Yeah. Um, but what this thing can do is on top of giving you, make sure I'm saying this right, diastolic and systolic. I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> Um, as well as giving you those particular readings, it can also plot um, like cuff pressure as a function of time. Um, so it's actually showing you where it gets that data from. It's not just a black box that's going to ping out the value for you. So if you want to show your students where exactly those two values come from, you can do it with that sensor, which is fabulous. 
Um, we've also got this little accelerometer and altimeter here. Um, now this thing comes with a rubber uh, surround on it, so this thing is designed to be thrown around, um, so you don't have to be gentle with it at all. Um, I should note that all Pasco kit comes with a free five-year warranty, um, maybe apart from the plates, as soon as you start using the plates in like a heavy testing environment, then their warranty is reduced to one year. Um, so please do just bear that in mind. But everything else with Pasco's name on it comes with a free five year warranty. Um, if you are thinking about getting these accelerometers and altimeters, um, please bear in mind that the altimeter section, the altimeter part of that sensor has a resolution of 10 centimeters. So you don't wanna be using something like that for jump height. Where am I? Here we go. Um, but yeah, any kind of other acceleration, you can strap that to anything. Um, what's it called? <laughs> um, when I went to Leicester Tigers, they had a they had like a rig where you um, like really push into something with your shoulder and then barge it and try and like uh, keep your force constant throughout that movement. Is it called a scrumming rig or something? Maybe it's that. But anyway, we we um, trialed um, stapling. <laughs> this kind of accelerometer onto that to kind of like look at that force impact, um, which was very cool. Um, so, I mean, like I say, you can you can strap that to anything. I think other kind of typical applications for things like that are like uh, weightlifting bars as well. Um, I think a lot of people want to uh, attach it to them. Um, and then some of our older type sensors, some of our passport sensors. So all of these ones here, these white ones, um, these don't require interfacing, whereas these blue ones do. Um, but if you were to use our Pasco Force platforms, we'd recommend that you buy an interface anyway um, for the higher sampling frequencies that you'll be using. So interfacing or no interfacing, it shouldn't really be a problem for you. Um, but yeah, we've got the breath rate sensor. Um, we've got ECG or EKG because um, Pasco is an American company, so they call it EKG. And um, we've got a spirometer. And then we've also got the goniometer over here. Um, so this measures like joint angle, so you can attach that to any joint. Um, and then that's a really good one to use in, conjun in conjunction with the force plates. So for example, you could look at um, like joint angle or force as a function of joint angle um, and measure them both simultaneously, which is super, super cool. Um, at the moment, the limitation on how many sensors that you can hook up to one PC is four, dependent on um, how high you're sampling. Um, but yes, if you did, for example, want to use like eight force platforms, um, definitely get in touch with us. Pasco are very interested in kind of pushing the realms of uh, what's possible at the moment. So if that is definitely something that you are interested in, uh, yeah, just give us a shout and we'll see how we can support you with that. Um, so on top of the data logging range, we also have got like um, full uh, experiments for sports science. Um, so these are really physics experiments, uh, that's where PASCO really is the powerhouse in, in the physics discipline. Um, but I mean, for your mechanics modules, um, you're just going to be teaching basic physics, right? Um, so with our smart cart dynamic system, you can do things like conservation of energy, momentum, um, like differential relationships between speed, velocity and acceleration. This is ideal for that. So you're talking about, I think this goes from about 550 quid for the more basic model. Um, and then working the way up through through the different accessories that you can get with that. Um, and then we've also got these lovely little uh, ring launchers, sorry, not ring launchers, um, mini launchers. Um, so these are just like uh, projectile launchers. Um, you get like uh, different size balls in there, um, but this really hammers home like the SUVAT equations and equations of motion, um, which can be a little bit dry if you're just doing it with the equations, um, especially with maybe sports science students that aren't really that interested in maths. So again, this might be a nice piece of kit to kind of engage them in a bit more of an interactive way of, uh, of approaching that particular um, teaching syllabus. Okay, so moving on to the actual demo part, I'm just gonna talk about the software that we recommend to go with the force plates, um, which is called Pasco Capstone. Um, to get the software it is a one-off fee. So I've put that, <laughs> as a point on here, for our secondary customers, they're just going to be like, well, obviously it's a one-off fee. Um, but for sports science, I think you guys have a bit of a rough ride actually when it comes to software, because whenever I come into a department and I say it's a one-off fee, you guys are like, what? You don't have to pay for it every year? And it's quite it's quite an alien thing for you. Um, but no, as with um, most like physics software that, that I've come across, it's, a, it's just a one-off fee. So you just have to pay for it once 
And then all the updates that you get, you get like software updates and even firmware updates. Um, all of that's for free. Pasco typically push out a, an, an update for Capstone like maybe once every six months or so. Um, so all of that will be completely for free. As soon as you log on to the software, it will say there's an update available or will ping you an email telling you that there's an update available um, and you can get it completely for free. It comes as either a single user license or a site license. So single user, um, that's for just the one PC or laptop. Um, and the site license will do all of the PCs in your department or if you're a school, all of the all of the PCs in your school. And then on top of that, if you wanted to give it out to students, so they've got it on their own personal machines, of course you can do that. Um, you can just give them the code and they'll be able to store it on their own machines. It's available for both Windows and Mac. So if you're fortunate enough to, to have a Mac, we, we can still support you on that on that operating system. Um, so Capstone gives you the ability to do real time data collection and analysis. So if uh, it's not just kind of like just a collection suite, so you can record your data in it. And then if you wanted to do your analysis in there, absolutely you can do. Um, but again, if you wanted to export it in uh, from there, to a third party software, then you have the ability to do that as well. <clears throat> on top of that, it's got an extensive calculator. So that means you can calculate metrics on the fly. So as you're recording data, if you wanted it to say, for example, to ping out your jump height, um, it would be able to do that. Um, so it means that your students can get like immediate feedback or your athletes can get immediate feedback um, just by using the plates there and then. It has got built in video analysis, so all you've got to do is just plug in a USB camera as well as your plates um, and then you can automatically sync your video feed with the sensor data. Um, so that's a really nice feature. Obviously, you can do that also with um, motion capture systems, which the uh, which the St Mary's case study delves into. Um, but if you wanted to introduce just simple video analysis, um, then you can do that in Capstone. So that might be really useful for things like lecture demos. So for example, if you didn't want to do a jump in front of your students, um, if you didn't quite, um, if, if you've not really not, not like got the time or anything, um, you'd be able to do that um, just by displaying your, your screen and just playing it back for them there and then. And also might be really useful for like remote, um, remote teaching as well. You can try all the software completely for free for 60 days. So all you've got to do is just log on to the Pasco website and then just download the software. All of the features will be in that um, trial. So there's like nothing hidden. Um, so everything that's there, you'll be able to use if you were to buy it. And then just lastly, it is supported software, so it won't go stagnant. Like I say, Pasco do push out regular updates for this um, and they are completely for free. So. Yeah, there's not going to be there's not going to be a time where it's kind of like out of date, if that makes sense. Right, OK, so let's get going with the demo. Um, what do I need to do? I'm going to switch you over to my other camera. Which is on. Right, so. Can I make my screen any bigger? I don't know how to do that. Nope. <laughs> right, I'll just have to keep my eye on it. OK, so here is my massive bump. There's a whole extra person in there, which is just crazy. <laughs> but yes, here we go. I'm going to show you the two axis plate first. Um, I'm going to mainly focus on the PS2141 single plate um, because that's our most popular one. It will typically do everything that you want the force plate to do. Um, and I think this one only offers slightly a little bit extra and it is a bit more expensive. Um, but I'll, I'll show you this one first to, to get out of the way and show you what extra you can do with this one. Let me just close this a little while. Right, so this is what the plate looks like. Um, it's about 37 centimetres by 37 centimetres and comes off the ground, say, about like seven centimetres. Um, it is a passport sensor. So it comes with this kind of plug. So obviously we need an interface to, to plug that into. So, oh, in terms of load, uh, this can measure 4,400 newtons in the upwards direction and in the downwards direction. Um, and then on top of that, it can measure this like lateral force as well, this sideways force, but it can only measure that in one direction. Um, and it measures it via this like rolling plate on the top. 
So there is like an ever so slight little bit of instability with this plate that you just bear in mind if you've got someone to jump in maybe quite high on it, you want them to be quite careful on this one. A lot of universities don't really have a problem with it, but some people think that's just a, a complete no go. So it's kind of completely up to you what your preference is. OK, so as I said, this has got like the passport termination on the cable. Um, so this can connect into any of PASCO's interfaces. The top two that we see used with this piece of equipment are, yeah. So we've got one which is the Airlink. Um, so this can accept one force platform um, and tether it to your PC by USB via one USB socket. Or we've got this Sparklink Air. So this is one of Pasco's oldest uh, interfaces, a little bit more retro. But you see this has got two ports on it. So this can accept two force platforms and connect it to one PC by one USB port. <laughs> so you might be thinking, which interface do I need to buy? So this is the most affordable one. I think this one's about £67 and this one goes for about £210ish. So it's cheaper to buy two of these than one of these. But there are some advantages of being able to use this one. So the advantages of this one are that obviously you are like um, getting that data stream from the two plates via one interface. So you're not going to have any problems with like lagging between your sensors. That doesn't mean to say that you are going to have a problem with this one um, and you can correct for that in the software and um, you can stick them together in the software. But obviously with this one, it's automatic. Um, on top of that, we have got the little voltage sensor here so that can take 10 volts max. Um, so that is the little thing that St Mary's used to um, connect it to their Vicon mocap system. Um, they use it with a TTL trigger on their, on their cameras um, and that's how they do that. And then on top of that, we've got a little temperature socket here. So that can accept one of those fast response temperature probes that I was talking about before with the uh, with the Sunsland case study. But obviously bear in mind that if you have got, if you are doing core body temperature measurements with this interface, then bear in mind that this is quite bulky. So you're gonna have to securely strap this to the person's body while they've got that in there. Cause if you've got this kind of weight tugging on it, that's not gonna be comfortable. <laughs> um, Anything? Oh yes, so the only other thing you want to bear in mind is that if you get these sorts of interfaces, um, then there's no real opportunity to kind of like use the plates on their own, if that makes sense. Um, so you typically like buy one of these for two force platforms, um, so you'd kind of always want to use them in a pair, otherwise you might need two lots of these if you wanted to use them individually, whereas with these um you've always got the option to kind of go individual if you just wanted students working with one plate instead of two for example and um, it's much easier to do it with these so those are the interfaces in a nutshell so i am going to go ahead and connect my force platform to this interface so you'll see again that this socket on here has been like asymmetrically cut it's not like bang in the middle and neither is this. So it just means that when your student comes to maybe plug this in the wrong way around, it means they're not going to bend the pins in here. So Pasco was super thoughtful about how they put their equipment together. And this is why it lasts such a long time. So all the people that work at Pasco, most of them are like ex-teachers. So they are fully aware of the kind of things that students do <laughs> in order to try and break equipment. Um, so now I just need to tether this thing to my PC. And I do that by mini USB should be one of these cables. There we go. Now both of the interfaces have got the option to tether wirelessly to the PC. So they've got a Bluetooth radio in there so they can connect by Bluetooth. Um, and you might have heard that Bluetooth is actually faster than USB. But for the amount of data that we're transmitting, it can't actually do that at that bandwidth. So it's much better to, to tether by USB just to make sure that you're all sorted for your sampling rates. Let me just keep that slightly ajar so my computer doesn't overheat. Right, so now I need to start up the capstone. Hopefully you can still all see my screen. So there is another software suite available from, uh, from Pasco called Sparkview. Um, St Mary's do use that, but 
it's not as good as it's not as good as capstone so i wouldn't really recommend it um, i think they just use they, they, they carried on using spark view just because they've always used it and they're comfortable with it and they don't um, necessarily use any of the extra features of this um, so what we need to do is come to hardware setup so this shows us what we've got connected to the pc so this tells me that i've got my air link connected and i've also got a force platform plugged into that which is fabulous if you were to plug everything in and it doesn't come up with anything here just close down the software unplug everything plug everything back in again and just make sure it can see it so that's the first that's the first uh, tip for troubleshooting if, if something's not working properly so these are all the kind of like um, quick start guides for how you can uh, look at your data so i just want a graph so i'm going to double click on the graph icon up here and that's going to ping up a graph on my whole display and then I want to select measurement on my Y axis. So uh, force platform, I'm going to want it to measure uh, normal force. So that's the vertical force. You can also see that you can see the force beams. So force beam one, two, three and four. So these load cells are located in each corner of the plate. So that's what they refer to. Um, and each corner is numbered so you can tell which uh, which force beams which. I just want to look at my normal force and as soon as I've selected something on the Y axis um, on the X axis, it will default to time. Uh, and I'll remember this one is the 2D plate, so it can also read that lateral force. So I'm going to want to plot that one as well. So if I come up to here and put on a new Y axis. Uh, and then put parallel force on there. And then what I need to do is make my zero points the same. So if I come to display background is it all actually share origin yes please and it doesn't really matter if they scale together they're not going to be come will they be comparable uh, let's have a go right so this is my sampling frequency down here i've only got one sensor connected so far so it's not going to show me anything else in this box at the minute it's sampling at 20 hertz so that's the default for the force platform i'm just going to up that to the maximum which is a kilohertz um, in the published works, I've seen people using like a minimum of 500 hertz, so anything above that should be OK. I think the next denomination you can go to is 500, um, but we'll just push it to the maximum because because why not? So all I need to do now is. Press tear on the force platform, make sure none of my wires are on top of it, causing any 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 load. So the tear button, all that is, is it's just like a zero feature. So it's the same as like on a like a, a top pan balance that you'd get in a normal lab. Um, the tear button's just on the side of the plate where this silvery cable goes into it. Um, so I just need to press that just to zero everything off. Now, as you do tear it, make sure you're not like pressing on the plate and pressing tear because otherwise that's going to make the tear uh, all wrong. But it is something that we've seen a lot of people do in practice. So, yeah, just bear that in mind. Um, so, as I said before, this is kind of like seven centimetres off the floor. Um, so if you do have someone that's like kind of jumping quite high on this thing, it can be a bit of a risk that they might land on it kind of like half foot on, half foot off. Um, so there are options to embed this into different kind of materials on the floor just so that you don't have that kind of step up, step down onto the plate. Um, so we've got a reseller called Perform Better who sell these things into the elite sports industry. Um, so they've got a ready made surround that's made out of either foam, um, which is super cheap, or they've got a slightly more robust one, um, which is made out of metal. Um, and then on top of that, one of our customers at St Mary's, the guy that's done the case study for us, um, he's got uh, designs for like a wooden surround as well, and he's very happy to share those out with people. Um, so if you if you want that, just uh, either email Jack directly um, or get in contact with me and I can pass you on his details and he's <laughs> he's more than happy to share that. But I mean, of course, you can make your own if you just take measurements of the plate. It's just a case of like cutting some holes in in a material to embed them. But yes, yeah, something else that I should also mention is this silvery cable on the side here. This isn't designed to take any load at all. So you just want to make sure that your students don't um, land or put any load on this cable. Um, if it does start to fray or it does start to become a problem, um, just get in touch with us. We can send you out a new cable with instructions on how to replace it. 
Um, so that's a repair that we can do um, in the UK completely, uh, completely easily. It doesn't, it doesn't require sending back out to the States or anything. We can do that repair for you here locally. Um, or if you're not comfortable taking it apart, um, you can just send it back to us and one of us will, uh, one of us will take care of that repair for you. Um, right, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to look at my gate. So I'm just li literally going to um, like uh, just walk over the plate and see what the, uh, what the data looks like. Oh, get up. I'm very unflexible at the moment. So what I'm going to do on the software is just hit record. Again, we're recording at uh, a kilohertz, so nice and high sampling rate. And then let's see what we get. And then if I press stop. So you'll see we get this uh, lovely M curve, which is what we'd expect. Um, and then you can kind of see it's a little bit noisy. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the change in, in that lateral um, force from me stepping onto and then off the plate. So I'm kind of like pushing it forwards and then pushing it backwards as I, as I come off the plate. Um, but this is me like making contact with my heel and then letting it roll onto the toe. And then you can see that maybe we've got a little bit of noise here, which is probably me actually stepping up onto the plate. Um, so again, if these platforms are like embedded, you might be able to get rid of that. Um, so obviously that, that is kind of like a feature in the data that's that's due to the my method um, of having to step on, up, up onto the plate. <coughs> so my data will be subject to that um, uh, that feature. Um, but that's the kind of extra information that you can get from this particular plate. Um, obviously, it can only see in that one direction, um, but you can always rotate the plate to make sure that it's looking in the direction that you're interested in measuring. Um, but you wouldn't be able to measure like that sideways motion and that sideways motion at the same time. It just is uh, not capable of doing that. Um, so that's this force platform in a nutshell. So let's move on to the uh, single axis plate. I'm just going to shut this software down so it doesn't get upset at me when I start unplugging things. Uh, I don't want to save it, so I'm just going to discard. Right. So I'm going to unplug this one. Um, one other feature that I'm going to point out about the plates is that they've got these like threaded screw holes in. Um, so they've got four. So this means that you can essentially screw these or bolt these onto anything. And again, Jack Line at St Mary's, he goes on to say uh, what different rigs that he's uh, that he's made with these things. You can literally screw them onto anything. Um, so, I mean, if you want them, you can have them obviously in this orientation, or if you want them at a tilt or even upright, again, you can do that and use it as like a pushing force, which is uh, super cool. So let me get this one out of the way. The two axis plate is significantly heavier than the, than the one axis two, so once you've been picking one of those up, these feel super light. Um, I should mention as well, so I think I just managed to uh, fluke it last time, but on the bottom of the plates we've got these like screw feet, um, so you can really level these plates out on the floor. Um, if you want to make sure that they're super level, just uh, put like a spirit level on top of them and just make sure that they're definitely level. Um, but you can just feel by touch whether they're level or not. Um, it's always better to try and find a flat piece of floor rather than having to compensate using the feet. Um, but where that's not possible, at least you've got the feet as an option to make it level. Right, so I'm going to use these in tandem now so you can see uh, how the force plates work if you want to use two at a time. So let's plonk what I'm still in your field of view. Let me just make sure that it's OK in, in Teams. Oh, so I'm using my uh, iPad as the camera and it comes up with that awful big circle. Um, so let me try and get out of the way of that so you can see. Right, so there's one. And here's another. wires. Lovely. Right, so again I'm just going to make sure that these are nice and level. These are slightly wobbly so I'm just going to unscrew one of the feet on one corner. So 
also the way that I check is I kind of like push alternate corners and if there is a wobble you'll hear it and then you can just uh, compensate for that for that height difference just using one of the feet and that one's nice and level already perfect so oh I've just moved it so every time you move it you just want to make sure it's definitely still level so I'm going to use a sparkling care the one that's got two receptacles in it um, and connect both of my plates to it so the one on the left I'm going to put in the left port And then the one on the right, I'm going to shove in this one. And this is an older uh, um, interface, so this needs a mini USB instead of micro. Is it this one? Nope. This one. Plug that in. And then it also needs AC power, so I'm going to just shove this in the back here, just plug it into the mains, and then with this one we have to make sure it's turned on. So <laughs> a lot of troubleshooting saying my stuff doesn't work and it's uh, literally just because you haven't turned this on, so just remember to do that. And then your LEDs will start flashing, and then we're all ready to go. So again I'm just going to make sure the cables are all out of the way, I don't want any of them touching the top of the plates. If you did embed these in something, if you built us around for these, you'd be able to hide all the cables as well. So that's a, another added benefit of being able to um, sync them into something. Let's open up Capstone again. <clears throat> I'm going to tear off both the plates when the software opens. Let's just make sure we can definitely see them. So it's sense that we've plugged in a sparkling air and we've plugged in two plates, so that's fabulous. And it can also see my air link, which is bringing out its Bluetooth signal, so I'm just going to turn that off. Lovely. Right, so yes, I'm going to tear these again now. And again, making sure I'm not leaning on it whilst I tear it. Uh, where's the tear button gone? There we go. So, what shall we do first? Shall we have a look at a quick workbook? Um, or shall I... Let's get a graph on and show you what they both look like. So I've just clicked and dragged the graph display onto the main screen. I'm going to plot the vertical force from one and the vertical force from another. Uh, both of my axes look OK, look like they're going to scale with each other. Let's choose our sampling frequency. We're going to choose common rate because we've got two of them plugged in now and I want both of them sampling at a kilohertz. And then oh, one foot on each plate. And then if I hit record and do a big jump and then stop. So that's typical jump data. <laughs> Maybe slightly noisier because I'm a bit less flexible than normal at the moment. Um, but say, for example, if we wanted to do a calculation and just sum those two things together, you can do that in uh, in Capstone. So what you've got to do is come to the calculator and then click new. So this highlights that thing called Calc1. So this is just the name that we're going to give our function. So if we call this uh, sum force. My midwife doesn't watch this back. She's gonna, she's gonna kill me. Uh, so sum force equals. Uh, can I get on the other side? That equals yes. Um, and then to pull up sensor data, all you've got to do is just press the uh, left square bracket. Um, and then I'm gonna want to choose vertical force channel two plus left square bracket vertical force channel one. So that's just gonna sum everything together for me. Then press enter. And then it's asking for units, obviously it's going to be in Newtons. We're just doing Newtons plus Newtons. Lovely. So that's my um, simple calculation setup. And then if I wanted to, I could pull on another uh, Y axis. And then in here, it will come up with some force, which is our new, our new um, measurement that we've just created. And it will plot that for me. So you can see now that <laughs> Um, the scale isn't quite the same, so we can come to 
all axes share origin. I've just right clicked now on, on the on the display. All axes share origin. All axes uh, scale together. Start from zero. So you can see that it's kind of like sum those two together now, which is fabulous. So that's how easy it is and how quick it is just to set up a quick calculation. Um, so all of our workbooks use this calculator to enable to like ping out these metrics automatically. Um, so it's super easy to set those up. Um, and I'll give you some examples of workbooks that we've generated. So one of our most commonly used ones is the jump one. So I'll open that one. Uh, I don't want to save my changes, so discard. Um, oh, yeah, we need to do that one. Uh, where is it? Time of flight. Let's do that one. So we have also got a centre of pressure one, which just looks at the one plate connected. So I'll unplug the other one again in a minute and we'll have a look at that. That's a common one that um, sports science departments want to use. But with this one, um, this is our jump height one. So it looks at both plates um, and then it'll determine your jump height from a SUVAT equation. Which one is it? Uh, so jump height is half um, G, so acceleration um, times T squared. But obviously the hang time, the time that you're off the plates for, you need to divide that by two because it takes into account you know, like you're jumping up and you're jumping down. So it's essentially, um, you know, half a T squared, which is how we work out jump height. Um, so this is for a counter movement jump. So this is my other half having to go earlier. So <laughs> definitely not as um, inactive as I am at the moment. And also a lot lighter than I am at the moment. Um, but he managed to get like 30 centimetres earlier. So he was super happy with himself. He was like, oh, tell them all I'm an athlete. I was thinking I'm sure like an elite athlete would definitely be able to do better than that but <laughs> he was very proud of himself regardless. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to tear these off again just to make sure they're not strayed uh, and then I'm going to hit start so you'll see that these uh, this workbook's got some particular recording conditions on so when I hit start it's going to do like a two second delay here where it's going to be like monitoring the data but not actually recording it so i need to make sure i definitely don't do any movement in this first two section two two seconds sorry and then it's going to take the data and it's going to use this hang time when the force goes to zero so you're completely off the plate it's going to use that hang time to determine how high you jump so i'm going to need to stand on the force plates to begin with because this, well, this is where it gets my uh, baseline reading for weight from this is going to be very embarrassing because I'm absolutely ginormous at the moment, but we'll blame it all on the baby. <laughs> so I'm going to hit record. It's monitoring. And then do a jump. And then stop. So I'm still managing to jump 10 centimetres, which I think is quite impressive with the whole of the human on board. <laughs> but this is the hang time that it's determined uh, for me. So it's literally managing to take out the reading where it starts to go to zero and then uh, stops being zero. And then it just runs it through all these different uh, calculations and then pings out the data for us. So all nice and super easy, <laughs> hopefully. Um, this is just like a nice way of just demonstrating exactly what Capstone is capable of doing. You can have like different displays if you want a graph display and a digits display. Absolutely, it can support that. Um, we've also got lots of other different options for displays here. Um, so you're not limited in the way that you want to display your data. So let's start a different workbook. Let's see what else I can show you. I don't need to save my dismal attempt at, <laughs> at a jump. Um, this is also a really nice one, this two, uh, two platform balance. I'm going to make sure you've all got links to these workbooks. So if you want them, they are yours. So what this one does is it has a look at the difference between the force plates and then it divides it by the sum of the force on the force plates. So what it's going to do is as I stand on the force plates, it's going to look at where like my centre of mass is, um, like which leg I'm putting most of my load through. Um, so if I 
you want to make sure as well that you're always standing on the plates for this one because it's measuring the difference. Um, so if it's just reading noise, then it's just going to give you a, a silly output. So if we hit record. Oh, it's not doing anything. Let's have a quick check. Common rate 20 hertz. Hit record again. Is it going to do anything for me? No. OK, let's make it from scratch. Uh, let's start capstone again just to make sure it's all OK. So again, this is just a nice way of uh, reinforcing how we do those calculations. So it'll only take me two, two seconds just to plug those equations in. <coughs> so hardware setup, we can definitely see those both channels. Um, come to calculator. Ooh. So we'll call this balance. Worst view for you guys, I do apologise. <laughs> Um, so balance equals, hey, what's going on here? Balance equals left square bracket. I want to find out the difference of my plates. And then I want to put brackets around that to make sure it does that bit first. And then I want to divide that by the sum. So channel two plus channel one. And again, I'm just hitting that square bracket to pull up my measurements list. I think you can call up your measurements from here if you wanted to, but it's just easier to do it by, by the square bracket. My beginning bracket needs to go up here. So we're doing Newtons divided by Newtons, so that's got no units, so uh, we'll just leave that blank. And then we'll just give it the zero point. Silly. Right, and then let's get to graph up here. And then I want it to start at zero in the middle. And I want this to be balance. And on the y axis, I want this to just be time. And that should do it, hopefully. I've just nudged that, so let's just make sure everything's uh, teared off. I'm going to hop on the plates and hopefully it'll be behaved for me. Yes. So I'm distributing my weight evenly at the moment. Hang on, let me just uh, zoom in. So this will have a maximum and minimum of one. So we should scale our axes accordingly. So it looked like I was super balanced before, but you can see I'm kind of like all over the place. Let's try, let's try again. Uh, is it doing it? Delete the last run. Oh, so as I put all of my weight on my left foot, you can see we're going all the way over to the left and then all my weight on my right foot all the way over to the right. So what athletes would use this for or strength and conditioning coaches would use this for? Would they get an, would, uh, they get an athlete to perform like a movement, like a squat, um, and then just make sure that they can uh, keep their weight as evenly distributed as possible so say for example if an athlete's got like an injury in one of their legs um they might be wanting to put more weight on their good leg so say for example if my right leg was my good leg it might look a little bit like this but obviously if they're doing that they're putting their good look uh, good leg at more risk um so they kind of want to train away from doing that i believe that's what they use this for um, so yeah if, say for example if you do a squat you kind of want it to be I'm definitely putting more weight through my left one on to through my right one. Um, but again, this is like a really nice way of just uh, kind of measuring yourself and uh, kind of seeing how good you are at these things. So again, if you've got that kind of like disengaged physics student in the lab that just doesn't want to do anything, this might be a way of getting them engaged and uh, actually having a go and widening participation with those students that think they're a bit too cool for science. So that's that one. Let's have a look at what else I can, I can show you. Nope. Um, we've got a mid thigh pull template. Um, so that's where an athlete would say, for example, stand on these two things. And then they've got like a fixed bar. And then what they do is they would like take the strain in their legs and then pull on that bar like 
<laughs> like nobody's business and then see how much force they exert through the legs as they're really like pulling up on that bar um i don't have one of those rigs here um but if you, if you are interested in that you can either make your own or perform better our reseller they've got a rig all set up for that um rate of force development that just looks at your force time graph and then takes a differential of it and um, so you can see the rate of force um as standard in in two different graphs um, and then this centre of pressure, let me go for that one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close all the software down and I'm going to unplug one of the plates. So this only needs one plate, which is why I'm going to get rid of one. I might plug the air link back in as well. So you can see how easily I'm moving this. Um, it's super, super light and easy to manoeuvre. I'm just uh, adjusting the screw feet slightly just to make sure it's not wobbly. Yep, that'll do. Here's my air link again. I'm going to plug my plate into my air link. So hopefully you can see just how easy it is to plug and play with these things. It uh, only takes a minute to connect them. Uh, and then I want to come back to capstone. And then look at that centre of pressure workbook. Here we go. So centre of pressure looks at kind of like how my force or weight is distributed um, along the plate. So kind of last time it kind of looked between the two plates. But now this is going to look along both axes. So it's basically going to look at the uh, force exerted in kind of like each each load cell um, and map that out for me. So even though you're standing completely still, um, as you're standing still, you kind of are still like constantly correcting yourself and your centre of mass is actually changing. Um, so we used to have a sports science work, a sports scientist working for us called Stu Dixon. Um, he worked with us for about a year or so. And he used to be the technical manager at um, Sunderland University in their sports science department. Um, and the way that he described this was that if you had like a um, like a string dangling down from your belly button um, as you uh, like moved around, it would kind of like map out the like the uh, the weight at the end of the string would kind of like map out your centre of pressure. That that's essentially what this graph showing here. Um, so he's the mastermind behind this work, work behind this workbook. He used to absolutely love these force platforms. <laughs> Um, so we, uh, we've got this plot generated here. I'm going to hop on in a minute and show you um, how this updates in real time. And then on the top right, we've got this displacement time curve. Um, so this kind of shows the rate at which you're going to be shifting your, your um, centre of pressure around. So if that's all nice and constant, it just means that you're constantly moving at a, like a constant rate. But if you see like a massive increase in the gradient, then you've had a big wobble basically. And then down here, we've got measurements of the uh, anterior posterior range, so how much you've moved forward and backwards, and then your medial lateral range, so how much you've swayed side to side. So I guess the, the goal here is to, to be nice and stable. <laughs> Let's see what I'm like. So if I hit record. And then if I just show you how it works, if I put all my weight on my heels and then all my weight on the top of my toes and to the left and to the right, you can see it changing. So this has got some uh, recording constraints on there. It's only going to record for 10 seconds. Um, but if I grab this and move it out of the way, you can kind of see that I was behaving nicely along this part. I was trying to keep my balance and then I started showing you what was going on. <laughs> so you can see a massive change in the in the gradient here, which is where I started really shifting my weight. So let me try and uh, stay as still as possible and see how good I can get. Again, with this one, you want to make sure you're on the plate from the beginning of the data collection because it's just uh, calculating differences. So you'll just get a super noisy reading if you're uh, if you're off the plate. Oh, that's not bad, is it? So my medial lateral range, how much I've swayed side to side, that's super small. And then uh, anterior posterior, that's about double. Um, and then with this one, can I zoom in on that? Let's 
manually do it this way. So you can see it's kind of like almost a constant gradient throughout, which isn't too bad. I'm quite happy with that. But again, this is a really nice workbook that's got some quite complex metrics in there. Um, so again, if you want this, more than happy to send it to you. I'll make sure the link's fully available for you. Um, let me just show you how to... Let me change my camera because you do not need that awful view of me. <laughs> um, how do I do that? Not hide device settings. Uh, come back to this one. Not that one. This one. Oh, back on my face. Hello. Um, so as you can see, this kind of like calls the uh, force beams, the load cells into into question. So the way that you access those, let me just come off this and show you from a black screen, just so you guys know how to do that. Because when you prompt capstone, it doesn't actually give you those as, as standard, so you'll have to like turn those measurements on in the software. Um, so I think if you come to the data summary, yeah, so the, again, hardware setup, we can see that I've got my Airlink connected and my force platform. Then if I come to data summary, it can see that uh, this is what the force platform is and what it can read, which is vertical force. But we know that it can also see those individual load cells as well. So if you click on the little eye here, you can just toggle these on. And then as soon as you've got them there, you can prompt them in your calculator. So again, if you just call this calc equals and then left square bracket, you know, you've now got access to all of those force beams so you can create calculations with them. That's how you do that. Right, I genuinely think that's pretty much everything that I wanted to show you. Um, Pasco, there's a there's a uh, absolute wizard Pasco called Mike Paskowitz, um, which might make you think, oh, maybe he owns the company, um, but he doesn't. He's just uh, got um, a very um, coincidental surname, which is spelt with a K, not not a C. Um, but these are all the workbooks that he's put together. He's an absolute wizard at this. Um, so again, I've put the link for this um, in the notes that I'm going to be following up with. Um, but there's loads of different things that you can calculate here through those metrics, um, like relative strength index.